The opinions of the guests and host are their own and do not represent the opinions of Ironclad, the Border Patrol, or the Department of Homeland Security. I mean, MS-13 or any gang like it, you know, they are the minor leagues. I mean, yeah. you know, versus the major leagues. The groups that are operating in Mexico is a whole nother level uh, in terms of their training, their weaponry, their sophistication, their penetration of, of society and politics, their the amount of economic capital they have. It is a just a completely different game there. We cut through the partisan talking points. We're not interested in perpetuating fear. We're interested in seeking truth, hearing what's really going on on America's borderland. Welcome to Borderland, an ironclad original. Today is the second part in a two-part series on the situation in El Salvador. I am joined by the co-founder of the group Insight Crime, a think tank dedicated to researching organized crime, Stephen Dudley. He's also the author of the book MS-13, The Making of America's Most Notorious Gang. Last week, we learned about the crackdown on crime in the country by President Nayib Bukele. This week, we do a deep dive into the gang's origin and what it can teach us about crime, deportation policy, and immigration. Here is Stephen Dudley. Would you be able to kind of give uh, the listeners the, I guess, what would the origin story be for MS-13? And just, uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, and I grew up in the 90s in the heavy gang era, era during that time. We started to hear more about MS-13 and how violent they were in the L.A. streets. Started having friends getting jumped, stabbed, shot. Uh, the Colombian necktie kind of came back uh, in, in the L.A. area at the time, which was known to be done at the time. At, at before that was more of a Colombian thing, but uh, it seemed that the MS-13 started doing violent crimes. Just as And, and anyone listening to Colombian neckties is kind of slitting someone's throat and pulling their tongue out of that opening um, and you were starting to see more violent and graphic deaths, uh, all associated to gang violence, but mainly so MS-13. And so I did grow up in an area that did have that, and I didn't know until later on um, the whole story. And so if you don't mind, would you be able to kind of give us a brief explanation of the origin of MS-13? Yeah, I mean, a uh, sort of thumbnail sketch of, of where they came from is is largely a result of of this sort of constant flow of people in and out of the United States. So this kind of sort of pattern of immigration. The first wave of immigration comes in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and that's from El Salvador and different parts of Central America to Los Angeles particular in particular. And in Los Angeles, they lived in some of the most densest dense areas where they were in I guess, sort of competition, if you will, uh, with other ethnicities and nationalities, in particular, the the Mexican, um, you know, and sort of um, of Mexican origin gangs, let's say, that were yeah. already operational in those spaces. So in L.A., in those dense areas during this time period, lots of tumult, lots of competition and they emerge in that in that atmosphere at first as kind of a group that was very fascinated with um as many of these groups are with with music you know a lot of them start around sort of sports organizations or those sort of collective interests in their case it was it was music and it wasn't just any music it was heavy metal music yes. so they were very interested in heavy metal music. And one of the first clicks, you know, they called themselves the stoners and, you know, these sorts of things. They had long hair, they bobbed it up and down, all that sort of things. That was, they, they looked for those means by which they could connect with one another. One would be of, you know, your origin, your country of origin, your language, of course. And then there's other interests aside from that. And it was music. But over time, due to a lot of this sort of living in this competitive environment, um, they evolved. Uh, they evolved into this hyper-violent, um, you know, quasi-social, quasi-criminal organization that, you know, becomes a sort of major force, especially in these very dense areas in Los Angeles and begins to compete for space, uh, criminal economies, and other things that are happening inside of, of Los Angeles. They start to be arrested in large numbers. 
incarcerated, then connected to some of the other sort of larger big structures, bigger criminal structures that exist in the area, most notably the Mexican mafia um, and their collective of gangs they call the Sureños, which are all the sort of Southern California gangs. So they become part of this larger network inside the prison system. And then when they're let out, and it sort of coincides with the Clinton administration's uh, push to change a lot of the laws, they're deported in mass, um, in huge numbers, in thousands, in the thousands. They're pushed back to their countries of origin, Central America. And lo and behold, they find very fertile terrain in which they can export their gang activities and their name, their brand name. So you find, um, in, in particular, MS-13 and 18th Street being exported in mass to Central America and reforming there, reconstituting themselves there in an image that is a facsimile of what they'd been doing in the United States, but even more violent. Um, they found an even more sort of, you know, open terrain for them to operate with, you know, tremendous impunity over many, many years. And they formed and they, they, they create these structures that have, you know, almost, you know, challenging the state in many instances in places like El Salvador, which is a very small country about the size of Massachusetts. So it's not like, a, you know, you know, it doesn't have to, it's that they don't have to occupy a huge amount of space in order to have a huge amount of impact. And that was what was happening in places like Central America over, over many, many years. Yeah. And growing up in the, you know, in the LA area, in the San Fernando Valley, you know, those who understand kind of the gang culture, La Eme, the Mexican mafia, uh, essentially was kind of in a hierarchy on top of everyone. And the Sureños were kind of the foot soldiers, most Latino gangs, almost all of them who paid homage to the M, it took the 13 as a sign. The 13th letter in the alphabet is the M. So you have MS-13 and you have a lot of a lot of the thresse on a lot of the names of the, the Southern gangs. Uh, 18th Street, you mentioned earlier, is the only one that had enough respect and notoriety that they were allowed to keep their 18. Uh, but it's a very interesting prison kind of culture that kind of spills over into the streets. And, you know, in everyone in that Sureño space was trying to gain attention by the mafia, by the Mexican mafia as like the guys who, who are respected. And, you know, and from what I was raised to understand was part of the violence that the MS-13 would ensue on is because of gaining more notoriety and, and creating fear within the communities that they were the top bad dudes and to include 18th Street in that same kind of conversation. Um, what I didn't know was during that time of my growing up and being around it and seeing it, um, was that when people were getting deported, they're going back to El Salvador. The gang that was started here in LA is now wreaking havoc in the country of El Salvador. And, and from people, you know, individuals who haven't spent much time in their own country, but are now getting deported to that country and having to kind of find their way uh, in, in a country that most of them don't really even know because they were raised in LA. Fascinating, fascinating to see. And throughout the years, how did the MS-13 gang gain so much power in El Salvador? You know, it 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 ha didn't happen overnight. They they start out uh, sort of slowly usurping the power of local gangs because there were there were a large number of local gangs already operational in those areas. So that was a that was a process. Then they start to get incarcerated in mass in similar ways that they were incarcerated in mass in in places like California um and then inside prison they're the lowest in the uh in the totem pole so they're abused they're raped you know they're pushed aside you know so then there was a process whereby they start to gain power inside the prisons um and then that's really where they begin to sort of launch their 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 power is is from prisons because you know in the early 2000s the 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 Salvadoran government um, and the other governments in the region as well Guatemala and Honduras launch their first efforts at you know what they call sort of an iron fist policy the mano dura iron fist policies in which they are incar incarcerating increasingly high numbers of of suspected members of gangs and you know they use very kind of flimsy um evidence to to you know haul huge numbers of 
of them, you know, into the into the prison system. And it's from the prison system where where they begin to kind of reorganize and reconstitute themselves, sort of establish this very clear hierarchy. Uh, um, the the prisons are the place where the 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 sort of board of directors, if you will, of the MS-13 in, in, in El Salvador operates from, um, and they start to create this sort of systematic way in which they extort the bus the bus system in, in El Salvador, so they start to get a regular revenue stream. Um, they start to take over uh, spaces where drug peddling is going on, so while they are not the ones that are peddling the drugs, they're collecting the money from the people who are peddling the drugs um you know which goes by you know different names depending upon where you are traqueteros or tracatos or tracks or whatever you know you hear different names but the bottom line is that they're collecting money from from that operation as well um they get involved in contraband and they start to evolve as as criminal organizations do um you know as they extort more and more for example uh buses then like you've seen, you know, in, in many, a, a television show, you know, it comes to the point where the owner doesn't have any more money. So then the people who are extorting them says, well, then give me, you know, a percentage uh, of the ownership in the, in the bus cooperative or, or whatever company it is they're extorting. So you see that starting to happen as well. And so they start to have more economic power and then subsequently also more political power. They're, they're able to sort of a lot of times through their use of violence, um, you know, kind of get the the governments to, you know, negotiate or at least engage with them um, and give them certain concessions inside of the prison system. Um, so you see them kind of evolve and and just become a, a more and more powerful force in these countries, in particular in El Salvador. Uh, what role does gang violence play in the flow of migration uh, here in the United States? You know, do are they a part of the whole system that, we, that we've come to know? Well, I think we need to think of this in two ways. You know, one are the, the, the push factors that migrants have, um, and the other is the pull factor, the pull factors that exist. And both of these are going on at the same time. Um, so it's really hard sometimes to separate, you know, why exactly somebody left, because normally it's, it's a... It's a series of reasons um, that could include, in part, you know, economics. You can't find a job, but you also might be uh, persecuted uh, by government forces or by gangs. Um, and this is really where they fit into this: is that they, um, the gangs, are are doing a bit of all of the above. It's a very predatory criminal economy that they have set up. You know, most of their revenues. Um, you know, for for many many years, came from extortion, and extortion is incredibly disruptive of of many 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 people's lives, and they're extorting to the to the most base level. I mean, it's it's the person selling uh, tortillas at the end of the road. It's the one fixing you know the the sort of shoe cobbler, the local mechanic. Um, you know, all the way to people who they see, you know, might be doing some work on their house. So perhaps somebody who's already migrated to the United States is sending back what, you know, what's called remittances. And then somebody there who's receiving the remittances, I don't know, is uh, deciding they're going to build a back patio um, or maybe they get a new car. Um, any indicator like that can be a kind of flashing light for 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 the gangs to then target those those people. So all the way down to the base level, they're extorting people. And this this, you know, obviously is incredibly disruptive from an economic perspective, from a physical integrity expect, you know, perspective, yeah. you know, from and and they they begin to create at the same time these kind of uh, invisible borders is what they refer to them as. It's a, it's a really, perhaps even a bad name for it because they're not invisible. They're very visible to the people who live in these spaces. But the people, you know, cannot cross these borders because they're two different gang areas. Um, you can't visit your relatives. Sometimes your kids can't go to school. You know, um, some taxi drivers might not be able to go over one side or the other. 
um, you know, because of the competition for these predatory criminal economies uh, between the gangs, they start to create rivalries amongst one another so strong that they create these kind of borders. Um, and that also hugely impacts people's lives. Um, and to say nothing of the the sort of rampant abuse of and targeting of of women and minors and and others, um, you know, women perhaps in the case of the MS13 who doesn't allow women in the, in their ranks anymore, you know, sort of targeting them, you know, try to work with them or be their girlfriends or worse, you know, um, and then you know many minors, uh, you know, in terms of trying to bring them into the fold uh, and make them part of the part of the gang. Although having said that in over many, many years that I studied gangs, they often did not need to target anybody or recruit anybody. There was, there were plenty of people they could draw from without having to necessarily, you know, sort of forcibly recruit kids. There were plenty who wanted to join them without them having to force them. Yeah. It's great. It's just, just taxation, right? They're just taxing everybody. It's, it's a form of almost terrorism. You know, it's, you scare the people to make sure that they give you the money. Uh, that's, a, that's an unfortunate thing. But yeah, you've said that, you know, many undocumented uh, minors uh, don't actually join the gangs until they're across uh, the border. Can you talk more about that? Well, I mean, it really depends on your, your circumstances. Um, you know, I, I don't know what in what context uh, I may have said that, but, um, but certainly, you know, people join gangs, you know, in in their countries of origin, if if you're coming from El Salvador or Guatemala, um, you know, those kind of very, very, very difficult spaces in which, you know, you may join a gang just because you think it's maybe the best way for you to survive that area. You know, there are a lot of the same reasons you get in the United States for sure. Yep. Um, and then, you know, living these kind of disjointed lives, very often, you know, families are are torn asunder. Um, you know, because of economic circumstances, because of these predatory criminal groups. And so the the if there was a sort of common thread that that I found in amongst gang members, it was that normally their family had been had been split apart for for one reason or another. So their parents, um, one or both parents had gone to the US or gone to another country to try to find their way. Um and often they were left with other relatives or neighbors or things of that sort. And so then, even if they were then later reunited, that relationship was very often shattered and very difficult. And the lives that they were living in the United States, if they made it to the United States, were also um, very difficult. And, you know, their parents are working you know, often several jobs. Uh, so it's not like you're getting us, you, you know, there is no helicopter parenting in that space. You know, mostly you're kind of left on your own. Um, and a lot of that begins with, with this sort of process of people searching for new lives. Um, and in that process, families are, are torn apart. I mean, the, the sort of central family that I write about in my book, um, you know, the entire family is split, um, you know, in terms of who stays in El Salvador and who goes to the United States. Like all of the lead characters, brothers and sisters go to the United States at one point or another. And like, you know, like three brothers join the gang and like, you know, the others don't, you know, so it's not like it's not like it's sort of this systematic thing, like the whole family becomes part of the gang, you know? No, it's just sort of split up into all these different pieces. Um, and they're all just trying to make it as best they can. Um, but in their particular case, for instance, um, you know, uh, two of the brothers join the gang in Los Angeles, and then the third one joins the gang in El Salvador. So there's no kind of, you know, sort of strict pattern to these things, except to say that these these families are split into pieces because of these these forces these push and pull forces that you know make countries like El Salvador these places that you have just you know so much of the population um that lives in in another country i mean you know upwards of you know between 2 and 3 million of of 
you know, seven, seven and a half million Salvadoran born people live in the United States. It's just a weird thing to think about, you know, that, you know, you've got like 15 to 20 percent people who were born in El Salvador now live in the United States. That is just a massive number of migrants. Um, and you can see how these forces are, you know, pushing and pulling back and forth between these two countries and how it can have these kind of tumultuous effects on families. Yeah, I had never heard that number. That's insane to think about. What is it that pulls them, I would say, pulls them or pushes them to America? Is it all those things we just mentioned, the fear of potential you know, persecution or taxation from these, these gang organizations, but also to include some people want opportunity to be able to have afford jobs and be able to buy things or, you know, so, so all the reasons why, uh, that they're deciding to come over to America. Holy smokes. And you do work in Mexico, correct? Uh, yeah, I do. I do a lot of work in Mexico and it is a whole different game. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, MS 13 or any gang like it, you know, they are the minor leagues. I mean, yeah. you know, versus the major leagues. The 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 groups that are operating in Mexico is a whole nother level uh, in terms of their training, their weaponry, their sophistication, their penetration of, of society and politics, their the amount of economic capital they have. It is a just a completely different game there. When they when they, the gang members go there and we speak to them, you know, they are cowering in front of these other forces they they know they don't have a chance they don't even they don't even pretend um and as it relates to you know kind of one of your earlier questions about what the gang's relationship is with 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 migrants and immigration you know in some cases they are immigrants and they're trying to escape the the gauntlet that is mexico and trying to weave their way through all of these different criminal operations some of them very connected or are members of the government. Um, so they're there, they could be part of that, you know, trying to weave their way through. And I've written about this a lot, or they can be part of those operations. They can be hired by these different groups, mostly, mostly to be sort of intelligence, um, intelligence or counterintelligence inside these groups. They very often infiltrate these places, these spaces, you know, on top of these trains, they're finding victims, if you will, for these larger criminal groups. And at certain points, these larger criminal groups will capture, you know, small or large numbers of them and then extort them or just hold them for ransom or sometimes enslave them. Sometimes, just you know, they're, they're just trafficked. Um, so they could be trafficked as sexual slaves. Uh, they could be trafficked for other labor. Um, you know, and maybe sometimes they're they're forced into service, so they become foot soldiers. Um, so all of these things can happen in part due to these, you know, this role of of intelligence that that these gang members can very often play, you know, in that journey, mostly through Mexico. So there's all kinds of things that these that these you know gangs can be connected to. I'd love to hear some of the thoughts on on some of this massive influx we have in immigration. But, you know, when you go down to it, it's a lot of it is controlled by these trafficking organizations who've made this uh, a business and, and not just, uh, you know, a loose ended wild West business, but a very organized business that goes from other countries across the nation, across the world. Uh, and how has it gotten to that point? But I would love to hear from your experience of anything in insight on that. Yeah, I think it's I think you kind of nailed it there. I mean, you 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 nicely separate what are gangs which which for me anyway are more sort of social organizations first and criminal organizations second. I mean, they're they're this sort of surrogate family. They are a violent perverse surrogate family, but they are a surrogate family. These guys are not getting rich. Um, they're not super entrepreneurial. Some of them are. Uh, the irony is, of course, and we have chronicled this and I have chronicled this as well, is that if you're in the gang and you're super entrepreneurial, 
very often you're pushed out um, because you're thought of as actually usurping the social purpose of the gang, you know? And think about all the language around the gang, you know? The whole idea of being part of El Barrio, right? Yes. You know, El Barrio being the sort of substitute of, of the community, right? That's, that's in essence what it means. So that is one type of criminal group. It's a social group more than a criminal group. It is a criminal group, but it's social first, criminal yeah. second. And, that, and the, the drug trafficking organizations of the type that exist in um, in places like Mexico, are are entrepreneurial, right? They're they're Chiquita Banana. I mean, you know, it is this sort of multi layered corporate structure. You know, they have they have these layers in which they're literally, you know, um, hiring out third parties um, to do, you know, all kinds of things. Of course, they have their sort of core group, and these core groups. Do basically they have basically two functions. One is they manage the money, okay, which is super important. And you want to keep the money very tightly controlled. So that's one aspect of it. And the other is security, right? So those are normally the, the circles that are tightest around your sort of drug trafficking organizations. Um, and then beyond that, most of it is third-party labor. You know, they are they are literally hiring out. Brokers, in the case of of fentanyl, which is something we've been following very closely over the last few years, you know, they are hiring out brokers, brokers to find the precursor chemicals, which are the raw ingredients that, that they then use to, you know, make the the synthetic drugs. In this case, fentanyl, which is just a, a sort of white powder that they're that they're making clandestinely in these in these laboratories after getting these chemicals mostly from China. And they're hiring that out to third parties. We we actually spoke to, we were in Sinaloa in September, and we spoke to three different fentanyl producers. They were different level producers. Um, and we talked to them about what their relationship was, you know, with the larger criminal organization, which is the Sinaloa cartel in that area. And one of them was very much integrated, very much a you know, wholly part of the Sinaloa cartel. And the other two were independent producers. Um you know, and they had to fend for themselves in terms of finding their own chemicals. You know, they're subcontractors. <laughs> they're subcontractors. Of course, they can all turn to the larger organization for specific things if they feel threatened, um, for security. You know, in terms of like if the authorities are coming out and they have an operation that's anywhere near your laboratory, they can get the heads up. Those sorts of things, of course. And for that, they pay right. They are paying the, the the local cartel, in this case, the Sinaloa cartel, for those services, of course, but they are independent. Um, you know, so so it's it's like we think of these things as kind of, you know, monolithic and totally vertically integrated and structured. And that's not how they operate in real life. Um, they are these kind of multi-layered entrepreneurial groups. And that's why it's so hard to dismantle them because they can mix and match in the pieces. One piece gets taken out, they can just replace it with another piece. Um, and it this happens over and over and over again. Um, and yeah. the fight never ends because that's not how they're set up. They're not just, right. you can't just take out a leader or take out a driver or whatever. It doesn't no, matter. They, yeah, they lose people left and right. And all they do is just, just fill in, it's, you know, just fill in the dot, next person continues. Yeah, exactly. With with understanding that, how does a country like Mexico get control of their country again? You know, because I feel like the issues we have in America, obviously, majority of this comes through the southern border. We're not even talking about the northern border, but the southern border is the, the heavy area, and we can't gain any kind of control of the situation, specifically drugs. If we're saying human trafficking, anything you want to say, uh, until we kind of gain a little bit more control. I'm gonna say a little bit. I'm just saying that nicely uh, a little bit more control of what the the power of the cartel has in that country and so just from your experience of the years of journalism years of seeing these countries be corrupt and change uh any ideas on, on how we can kind of implement any kind of change in those countries help and support well i can't believe you're asking me that i mean that's like I mean, it's, you're a it's journalist. Like, it's like, I, I mean, it's like 50 years they've been trying to like do this and they haven't been yeah. able to do it. So it's it's obviously very, I would start by saying it is very, very hard, of course. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have 
I have some notion, you know, I mean, they, it, but it's all, it's all platitudes, you know, they have to cut down on corruption. They can't have so much impunity. They need to have more legitimate leaders. You know, all of the things that, 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 you know, everybody says all the time. I don't, I don't really know. Maybe we need to change the system. I mean, the, the incentives are, are very perverted. You know, maybe, maybe we need to figure out how to give people, you know, better avenues for becoming, you know, a different member of a different class. You know what I mean? Making money, you know, starting their own businesses, all of those sorts of things that, that we don't necessarily connect to like, you know, drug trafficking or getting involved in right. But, you know, if you cut off all avenues and, you know, or many of the avenues for sort of social and economic ascension, then I think you create by, by default, you create incentives for people to take, you know, their own paths and their own paths are very often related to criminal activity because that's what's left for them. So, you know, this is, this is kind of the sort of, you know, perpetual story in, in, in all parts of, of, of the region. Um, and certainly was also part of United States history as well at different points. Um, you know, you get groups or clans, you know, family clans that are involved in illicit activity, you know, and they sort of make their their fortune that way. And then they legitimize themselves. Yeah, that's I was going to say very reminiscent of the Italian mob. Right. The, the mafia is very, very reminiscent of, of several yes. different crime organizations that eventually very turned much. to try and go legit. And then years later, eventually now there's, you know. Uh, casinos that are owned by you know foundationally by some kind of organization at one point yeah yeah and you, i think you see that currently in mexico you see hotels being built and you're like that's a really fancy hotel you see these you know these kind of these tourist attraction locations you know i went to a place one time in in uh in mexico i went to uh what's it called ensenada and i went to an area called the bufadora and i was able to pet a lion a baby lion and a tiger and i was like I'm pretty sure a cartel boss owns these and kind of runs this area. And that's their way of creating, you know, a legitimacy behind their, their work that hopefully brings in another revenue stream and uh, go, please. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you see these guys are huge employers um, in, in large parts of, of, of Mexico and beyond. I mean, it's not, you know, just because you're in drug trafficking doesn't mean you can't also be in, you know, have cattle and, you know, do mining and, uh, you know, be involved in road building and everything else. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, and, and that's to say nothing of, you know, uh, providing money to the local church and, you know, funding the, the festivities uh, for Independence Day and, you know, helping out schools um, you know, maybe, you know, pulling out your wallet if if you see somebody who's sick who needs to go, you know, to the local hospital, you know, all of these things are are happening simultaneously. And for a long time, you know, there wasn't necessarily the violence that we see now. And for a long time, there wasn't necessarily the drug consumption that we see now. So one of the things that's going to be interesting in a place like Mexico is, how does this evolve now that you've had now, uh, you know, a decade of, you know, really hardcore violence and spaces that are not, as you pointed out, controlled by by the government, you know, in any clear way, in any, in any you know, in any case, and and simultaneously increased amounts of of consumption of drugs. Um, this is this is cocaine. This is methamphetamine. You know, this isn't, you know you know, run of the mill marijuana use or anything like that, which is moving in a place like Mexico is moving towards a similar, you know, sort of legal regime as we have in the United States. Um, you know, so I think that those will become issues uh, that that Mexican politicians and the Mexican populace writ, writ large will have to face. And it may change how they how they interact with some of these forces going forward. You know, I and <laughs> sorry I asked you that question. I and I'm gonna tell you, I asked you that question because I get hit that question all the time. Like, what would you do? And as much as it's like there is no, you know, you know, one plus one equals two answer for that. It really is just based on your experience. And and I really wanted to hear, you know, your thoughts on that. It's it's a topic that's 
like I said, it's a, it's a, it's the same tree, but many different branches. And, you know, when you look at a country like El Salvador and what they've done, you, you can't, I don't think you can copy and paste that in other countries and have the same effect. I think every country has its own dynamics, every, you know, political structure, every, you know, cultural structure, uh, will, will kind of root its own, uh, you know, outcome of a situation like that. And I think that's why Mexico is so challenging is that I believe there's, you know, we, we all know there's massive uh, corruption, but you know, there's massive amounts of money and a massive amount of employment. And, and, and it's almost some people see the Robin Hood in what they do, right? As in steal from the rich and give to the poor. But you no, know, sometimes they're the ones who are supporting, you know, some of the poor, the church, as you said, and these donations. And so it's a very complex situation. And uh, I, I really appreciate, you know, your views on this. Uh, as someone who focuses on the border crisis and seeing the spillover you know, what are some of the, the, the journalistic approaches or some of the stories that you guys are currently really trying to, to get more insight onto and something that you're trying to like tell? Well, there's a, there's a few for sure. Um, one is obviously the, the proliferation of, of criminal groups um, and the way in which the sort of atomization of these, you know, once, you know, super powerful criminal groups, you know, famous ones like the Setas, or the Gulf Cartel, um, and how they they have fragmented, and the way in which they fragmented then has made traveling through these spaces, especially for migrants, the most vulnerable populations, like migrants through these areas, it has made it, I mean, beyond a nightmare. Um, and and I don't think that we really you know, fathom how difficult and dangerous and and tumultuous that that journey is. You know, there's no, we don't necessarily even have like reliable statistics on you know how many women are are sexually assaulted or raped um, in that space. To say nothing of all the ones that are, you know, all the migrants that are extorted or kidnapped or into you know situations of forced labor. Um, and then to have that compounded at the same time with, with this very naive notion uh, from a United States policy perspective of saying, well, now you're going to wait in Mexico um, you know, for, for your case to be resolved. I mean, could we think of a better way to you know, sort of throw the most vulnerable populations to the wolves than to say, we're going we're gonna to put you there and you're going to have to wait there while we try and figure out what, you know, through a system that is, you know, very plainly broken. Um, so to see those two forces, you know, in juxtaposition with one another and to have these poor, you know, vulnerable migrants in between, you know, the sort of political forces on the United States side and the criminal forces on the Mexican side, that is, that's the theme, you know, that is what we look at. That is that is what we're trying to figure out and try and sort of you know shine a light on to say the quicker you can figure this out, yeah, um, you know whatever that is, um, figure it out. And if that's you know even even more pressure on Mexican authorities to to do a better job of dealing with these. Um, you know these migrant these camps where where these migrants are and these spaces through which these migrants are going you know there are ways in which the united states can incentivize the mexican government and there are programs that can be paid for you know means by which if you're going to force them you know back into those spaces can you at least you know protect them or give them a greater sense of 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 safety you know, I, I, I don't know. I, it's, I, if it sounds like I'm exasperated, it's because I am, because I've seen this play out and it is, it's desperate. It's desperate to say the least. What's, what's currently happening, and I think you, you've seen, is that a lot of the illegal migrants coming across are given that notice to appear and released into America. Do you like that policy currently better than them just staying in Mexico and, and potentially being a victim to any kind of, you know, cartel organization? you know, exploitations? I know that it's broken. And I know that many of these people never appear in their court, you know, in the court right. dates and all the rest. But I prefer that a hundred times over than sending them back to the wolves. I mean, it's just, 
it's just more humane. I don't know Get if it's it. politically, you know, um, you know, sort of possible on the on the U.S. side to to rejig the system, or I I don't know. But the, you know, I'm just looking at it mostly from a very perhaps naive, you know, uh, human perspective, and just saying, you know, from a human perspective, this is this is a tragedy what you're doing. You know, I mean, and 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 to sort of shrink the 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 number of categories for which you can also you know apply for asylum and and things of that sort you know to have that happen as well i mean i i feel like in many in many respects um you know the problem is is one of our own making i know again that's that can sound very naive but you know part of part of what you know sort of makes the modern day world operate is that we've given we've given sort of businesses um, you know more latitude to cross borders, right? Globalization, you know that's what we talk about. We talk about globalization, but we only talk about it in terms of these companies and the capital that has moved back and forth. Um, you know we don't talk about it in terms of labor, um, and at a certain point, you know, putting restrictions on labor so. That uh, if I if I would like to go to the United States and work, you know, you know, picking oranges or something like that, you know, I, it's really hard for me to do that, you know, and then go back and then go back again, you know. So part of me thinks like, well, why don't we have a system that is, you know, allows people to go back and forth with a little bit more freedom, you know, and then they are also going to, you know, move back and forth, which is pretty much. The system that we had up into around the 1970s, you know. So, you know, again, you know, these are very. It's a very simplistic approach, but certainly not one that was out of the realm of possibilities, you know. When George, you know, George W. Bush was in office, and they were trying to push forward similar type of, you know, temporary visa programs, and 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 things of that sort. So you've got that aspect. And of course, you know, we have a, a sort of, you know, a myopic view of, of uh, or maybe it's maybe a better description is a zero sum view of what migration actually is. You know, the belief that every migrant coming over is going to steal, you know, somebody else's job in the United States, which simply is not true. They take loads of jobs that people do not do in the United States. So, you know, there's 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 all kinds of sort of misunderstandings of what exactly is happening when that labor is moving, you know, um, across these borders and what kind of jobs they're doing, et cetera. You know, I don't know how to sort of, you know, create a counter narrative and, and also a, a sort of functioning system to make that, you know, so you can incentivize people to come over and go back. You know what I mean? Going yeah. back is actually pretty, pretty much in their incentive structure. If you think about how much cheaper, the cost of living is if they would, you know, bop back right. and forth, you know, so there, there, there are built in incentives into this, into this possibility. So I think we need to be open to these other possibilities. And there is visas for migrant workers. You know, they have to be sponsored by several, you know, some of the ranchers or, or the, you know, the owners of those crops and those fields. I don't know much about it. It's something I'll, I'll look into further. But the other side of this whole argument, besides immigration, is the homeland security issue where, you know, the fear of, you know, some people coming across and not being identified and potentially bringing harm to our nation. And so that's that's where this <laughs> this uh, whole interview even gets even more complex. But uh, we'll digress from there. I really appreciate everything uh, that you said and you've mentioned on the podcast. Uh, your insight for this topic is valuable. Understanding how a country like El Salvador can kind of clean up the streets to, to go from where it was to be clean, but also knowing that we can't copy and paste that into uh, a different format such as Mexico or, or other countries. Um, genuinely, I really appreciate your time, Steve. And, and I feel like, you know, the information you gave us today is, is a different perspective that I think people could, could take with them, hopefully be educated a little bit more on the subject and see a different point of view. And, and hopefully uh, we can continue to have this discussion and this dialogue that brings this country a little bit closer together on the topic. My pleasure, Vince, at any time. Yes, thank you so much. You have a good day, sir. You too.
Thank you for listening to Borderland, an Ironclad original. We'll see you next week.